Thank you. Big laps. Okay. Um, I want to talk. I want to talk. This model's been a nice one. It's illustrated many principles of system science, many principles of agent-based modeling, sort of insights we can get the ways in which structure determines behavior, or ways in which the data that comes out of a dynamical system, regardless of whether it's a model of it or, or somewhere out there in the world produced by a dynamical system, it relates to the dynamical system in structured ways. And it may be very different sorts of data, but they're all whispers of, they're all different facets of, different bases of an underlying dynamic system. And they can give you different perspectives on that system. But I have a confession. May I? This model could be rightfully criticized as almost, and it may in fact be essentially a linear model. And one thing to look at here is there's no mixing between people, right? People are solitudes. We follow each person out. There is interaction between these state charts, but sort of well-defined way. And um, there's not something where you get very different results if you have person A alone. Well, if you consider the results for person A alone and the results for person B alone, and then you consider the model and you sum those up, you'll get something very simple to if you were to simulate both together in the model at the same time, you're going to get basically the sum of what you get from those two. There's no interplay between them. And generally, the world isn't like that. We have entanglement, we have people interacting. And while it is true that structure determines behavior, while it is true we have emergent behavior with a linear model, the truth is that the type of emergence you get there, if you're clever about it, and I could mumble statements about diagonalizing matrix, performing symmetry transform, identifying the principal components, and Basically, you can untangle the system in ways that will allow you to reason about its behavior um, uh, in terms of sort of independent parts. The whole is not really that much different from the sum of the parts. Now, is this strictly linear? I'd have to think about it. I, I think because of the stochastics, the answer is no. Perhaps... Um, perhaps because of agents being deleted and so on, the answer might be no, but, but it's pretty close to it in any case. Most models that we build are not linear. And we could easily add something to make it not linear. We could easily add age, or at least not time invariant. We could add like people have a certain profile of, of uh, developing, um, of initiating smoking by age, et cetera. Um, but, we're going to go where we haven't gone before to a nonlinear context. And there's nothing that's going to reach out and hit you on the forehead about it being nonlinear. But um, I'll, I'll make an argument for why that is notion. Okay, so I'm going to close this model. And we can do it through close all, file, close all is another thing you can do. We're going to close it. By the way, it is posted. If anyone like it, come and get it up there on the site, okay? We okay with this? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen,
Your stomachs are full. And now I will fill your spirits <laughs> with, with the excitement of nonlinearity. Or at least that's my, that's, that's my modest aspiration. Or, or at least I'd like to, to make it satisfying. Okay, so we're going to add a new model. And this will rehearse some basic things we already know, but we're going to take it in a very different direction. There'll be lots of interactions between people. I pondered about doing it with that model. I could have had people starting smoking depending on the smoking status of people around them in their network. That would be pretty cool. And it's a very elegant way to do it. But I think we'll learn more by doing a new model, which illustrates some other patterns. If anyone's really interested, I could, you know, given 45 minutes that we could add add something like that in, it would be really interesting and sweet. And it'll be not like, okay, let's go do file new model. Need to at least build two separate models in this bootcamp. Okay. Okay. So what is this going to be? It's going to be called ABM crowding. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Okay. So what did I do? I went file new model and I'm going to do ABM crowding disparities. I, I probably could pick out a better name given time, but we're going to make the time unit to be days. Notice not years any days, because we're measuring things that are going to commonly play out much more frequently. Again, it doesn't mean they have different kind of steps. No, no, no. It, both could be simulated as close. If, if there were things in that other model, a time unit was a year. But if there were things that needed much more detailed time, you know, if there were a stroke phenomenon in there and minutes matter to get the person to the hospital, if you were to add that, that they could be handled no problem. It's, it, it's just... What's the convenient time unit for specifying things? Okay. What's the convenient yard stick or meter stick? Okay. Now we're gonna need we're gonna need agents. And these are gonna be people. How do we let there be agents in this model? We already have main. We've seen what main's job is. It's the stage in which agents strike. But we have to define what it means to be a person for this model. How do we do that? Does anyone remember? I know it's a long time ago, and it may seem like a galaxy far away. It was perhaps prior to your exposure to, you know, dumping, chanting, and so on, um, in whilst, you know, attempting to eat. Um, and so maybe you've forgotten. Anyone remember? How do we add that a theory of personhood? Hmm? How do we add it? We... Okay, I, I heard a, a, a rumbling. Speak on. Right click on the model. Do agent type. Funny, that sounded like my voice saying that. Um, okay, so, so we say agent type, and the agent type is going to be person, the capital P. Okay. Okay. Well, we're gonna have we're gonna have the I'm gonna do things a little bit differently. Order different things from the menu this time. Okay, so we have person up. Make sure you've opened person in the canvas. Make sure the canvas is up with person. Excellent. Okay, now we're gonna go to the palette. We know the palette a lot more. We're gonna go down to this area we haven't used before called pictures. Okay, now when people see this, sometimes more mischievous students' mind goes wild. And we end up getting, you know, models running across the classroom, you know, some with people and others with fighter jets and trucks and forklifts and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to add a person though, and if, you know, if you want to avail yourself of the 
the forklift. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to protest, but I'm going to put it up here, okay? <laughs> put it up there. Eric has a glint in his mind's eye. Um, okay, so we put a person icon up there. I dragged it in and I put it up. I put it up here. You ready? Okay. The forklift is leaving the room. Um, okay. Um, there we go. Uh, so we have a person. Okay, now let's suppose we want to... So, so if we run the model, will we see lots of people? Will we see that? If we ran the model, how many people will be in the model if we run the model right now? Yeah, that. Zero. Zero. None. You want to see it? Maybe you don't believe me. Check it out. Ain't no population. There's no one in the model. So what do we need to do to add them to a model? There's a there's a theory of personhood, which is recommended by great simplicity. Although maybe better aesthetics than our old one. It's certain. Um, but but there's no population. Where do we add a population? How do we add a population? One or more. Where do we put them? Where do they live? Maine. They live in Maine. Okay, so we have to go to Maine. And then this is maybe the trick you don't remember. And you can be forgiven for not remembering and remembering it. You go click on the theory of personhood class, the so-called class, the cookie cutter shape. Um and you drag it in to your model, okay? And and it's gonna try to call it person, just a lowercase version of that, but you'll really wanna call it population. So you could type out population here, make it all lowercase, or if, if you can't do that for some reason, you mess it up, you can go type it here. Just select it and edit it in the properties. Now, is that enough to have a population? It's a single agent. We need a population of agents. That's this other radio button. Do you see that? See this? That's what computer scientists call radio. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna click on it, okay? Mm hmm? Are you okay with that? And it gives the default number of agents 100. So if we run the model, how many agents are we gonna have now? In the model. Yeah, so right click it. Remember, run early, run often, although it's it's good to build early. Look at that, Wade. Still stubborn. I'm going to close this. I'm going to close any logic and reopen it because that that just looks weird. And I, I don't, I don't trust it. Um, it maybe it's suppressing other things here. So I'm going to say any logic. Uh, Wade's Wade's got good practice here. It's good as a matter of basic hygiene just to kind of close it out and come back in, you know, maybe after each session. It also uses an unseemly amount of memory sometimes, so it doesn't hurt to to do that as well. Okay, here we go. So generally, closing it down is good. It will spare yourself grief in multiple computational forms. Okay, so it's coming up and there we go and happy, happy. And okay, we're back in business. Let's let's run this here model. Oh, first of all, I'll build and I'll make sure it's, yeah, build completed successfully, happy. Okay, here we go. And Population 100, there they are. Population person zero, one, two, three. But you tell me, where are these people? You can click here and they're, they're here. Where are they? All on, top of on top of each other. Let's remedy that, if we may. So I showed you one way to do it before. Does anyone remember the way I showed you? It was a particularly simple way. It was all declarative. It was all 
point and click. What was it? We went to main and we scrolled down to space and networks and we selected layout type random. But we're going to do it a different way now because I want to give you repertoire and because this way is more general. And in fact, because this way is the way that we're going to build on. So we're going to go to population and we'll come back and make this a parameter and so on. But for now, I want to remember we're acquainting with cells with population compared to last time. We, we know the statistics area much more, but I want to do something different here. I want to go to the initial location and I want to say place agent in the specified point. Okay. And I want to place this agent, give them a location uniformly between zero and something called space width, okay? That's the width of the space. So this is going to determine the space width that we're calling it. That's why it just doesn't need any, any information to do its job. Um, so we call it, we get a number. It then calls this, and it draws a number from this value. Do we need a semicolon here? No, this is just drawing a value from here. For each person, it's going to draw a value from here. Are we okay with that? Okay. 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 So next, we're going to do a similar thing with their vertical location. But instead of space width, anyone want to guess what it is? Space height. Oh, not cell height, space height. Watch out. Don't don't always do what I complete with that's the first one. Okay. Are we ready for that? Are we okay? Okay. So I built that be no semicolon, because we're not telling you like do this. We're not saying like change this. No, 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 no. We're just we're just drawing values. Let's run it. So build. Make sure it's a happy camper and then run it. And there we go. Why are those people scattered around like that? Because each of them is placed what? Fill in the blank. At a random X and Y position. Good. Are we comfortable with that? Are we comfortable with that? Hearing no objections. Um, okay. Um, I'd like the TAs to monitor the online forum. I, I, I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, this is weird. I want to, oh, here's the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, Wait a minute. Am I am I showing the wrong screen? What screen is sharing right now? It's any laundry. Okay, cool. Okay. Great. Right. Okay. So we're gonna we're gonna do uh yes, go. Out of curiosity, it looks like uh your spatial distribution and mine were identical. Okay. So there's something I haven't been telling. Something I need to need to so you may have also noticed that model this morning, every time I ran it, if I didn't change anything, I got the same exact results. Did you notice that? Like down to the crenulations of the graphs and so on, their, their rise and fall was all the same exact thing. The numbers were exactly the same. So I have some explaining to do, okay? First of all, let's call this simulation baseline just while it's on our on our minds. But I gotta show you something. With any of these simulations, with any of these scenarios, I should have said the scenario, not scenario. Okay, down in each scenario, there's an area called randomness. And do you see that? 
randomness? See or not? Do you see that? There's this area called randomness. Maybe it's collapsed for you. But it's randomness. And you'll see what it says. Do you see what you say? Do you see what it says here? It says... Unique simulations are reproducible simulations with the same random number of seeds. You see that? So we've been running it for all our scenarios thus far. We've been running for that other model it with fixed seeds. And it's been totally reproducible because of that. We, we run it, we'll get exactly the same results. There's a lot of happenstance in these models. Exactly when someone, you know, recovered from or, you know, quit smoking or or when they developed heart disease, but it was always drawing from the same so-called random number generator with the same seed, okay? Um, and that means it would give the same happenstance again and again, again. Certainly we don't want that. It's it's useful sometimes to reproduce results. Certainly if you're, if you, if you want to, you know, have some output that you want to be reproducible, like for a paper or what have you, you're gonna to want to record you know, what your assumptions are about random number seeds if it's just a single simulation or what have you. But but in general, we're going to make it random ones. Now, to, to show you the impact, I'm going to leave it for a moment as fixed seed, and I'm, I'm just going to show visually um, this, this impact. Okay, I'm running it. And there we go. Um, so you'll notice that, so I'm going to focus without any sort of particularly privileging, I'm gonna focus on these three. Just make a note of their spatial position relative to one another. Are we, are we okay with that? Now I'm gonna run it again. And since this is a fixed seed with the same seed every time, the same sequence of random number general, same sequence of random numbers is gonna come out. And as long as I don't change the model or change any parameter values, which might, you know, change what's produced, it's, you're going to get exactly the same results. Of course, if I had different model structure, or if I had different parameter values, it might call the random number C different numbers of time, or the random number generator different numbers of times, and it would, um, uh, it would do, so if I altered the model, then it's not going to produce the same results. But you see here, with the same model, same scenario, same parameters, it's producing the same thing. Not that there are any parameters right now or dynamics anyway, but you see it's the same thing every time. Let's contrast that with if I have the random seed. Are you ready? Ready or not? Here we come. Okay, we're gonna run the model now with a random seed. Oh, it's different than the last one. Make note of it though. Maybe it's gonna be the same every time you might think. Okay, I'm gonna note those two. Now we're gonna run it again. Are we going to see the exact same thing as we just did? No, we're going to see something different. And we're going to run it again. We'll see something different yet. Yeah. Now we're dealing with luck of the draw for each one. See that? So most of the time, you'll run it with random seed. Now, sometimes this is A1 important. Like if you're running a stochastic sensitivity analysis. You're running the model many, 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 many times to see the broad regularities across all of these different simulations, which differ in the vagaries of random numbers. You want to see the regularities. Of course, you have to do random seed. There's a lot of cases where you need to do random seed. Um, so it's it's something you want to keep it keep track of. It's also something you want to know its default value is fixed. So when you when you build a new scenario, a build build a new experiment, and the default experiment when you first create a model will be fixed seed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Any question on that? Okay. I could go on about conditions under which you want to take advantage of that with paired runs, one differing from the other, and when the intervention takes place, the other being based on the same seed, but we're not going to go into that right now, okay? That's something Wade could, on which he could expound or I could expound if desired. Okay, well, we have some work to do. So first of all, 
we're going to self-respecting modelers, we're going to add a population size. Where do us where does what do we use to encode the population size? A what? Begins with P. Parameter. And where does that parameter live? It lives in me. Okay. It's going to be called population size. And what type is it going to be? Or don't mean that. What is its type? Is it a color? And it's an integer. And by default, we'll make it 100. Yeah. OK, now who's going to specify that parameter? There's a parameter, the values to that parameter. Remember, parameters serve two goals. So mention it many times, and I'll mention it more times yet. They encode values, and they communicate the values to be used from the point of creation of the thing in which they're located, in this case, main, to where they get used. So who's going to specify this value? Who creates main? The what? The scenario. Okay. So that's going to be specifying. It. So we're going to create a second scenario. And it's going to be called experiment. It's going to be called population 1,000. And you know where we're going with that. There we go. And I can make it a population size of a thousand. And really, I should call it baseline, baseline population a thousand, because nothing else is going to differ. And I'm going to run it, and it will be uh, have a oh, huh, huh, um, mumble, mumble. Oh, yeah. Why didn't that change? Of course. Why didn't it change? No, it's called population size, but what do we not do? So the variable. Yeah, we didn't operationalize it. Like we didn't enact it. We didn't put it into effect. So the initial number of agents here will be given by what? In the population. In this population, the initial number of agents will be given by the value of what? Population size. We okay with that? Build early, build often. Run early, run off. There we go. And then run it for the baseline, and you should see a thinner population. Hmm? But you know, I think I think I'm actually gonna. Since we have the choice right now, I'm going to make the bit default value a thousand because I I don't want to get the a slow variability. I'm going to make this the other alternative scenario be ten thousand, just because a hundred is kind of weak medicine. It's kind of small numbers, and I'd rather not deal with the sample errors. I I made the mistake of using a hundred in the last model, and it led to the sort of sampling. Weirdness is it'd be better use a thousand. No reason not to use a thousand. So, so I made this one uh, the alternative ten thousand, but the base a thousand. How did I do that? All I did is I changed the population size. And any scenario that didn't explicitly specify it will be updated accordingly. Don't do that at home frequently. Don't like you don't do that lightly. This is going to update all these scenario assumptions that didn't explicitly specify it. But at the beginning of a model, it's a good thing to think, what do you really want the default value to be? I want it to be a thousand. I don't want to have to specify for every single scenario. Okay. Okay. So that was one parameter we put into place. Now, and, and, and we're going a different, um, we're going a, in a different direction here. I would like you to give every person an income in this model. Every person a weekly income. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You okay with that? Okay. Where, how would I give them an income? 
I want them to be different from each other too. Each person is going to have their own income, and and we'll say it's a it's a weekly income. But um, where would I put that parameter? We're going to code it with parameter. It's going to be a fixed value once we assign it. Where would it live? If everyone needs its own value of it, person. in person, because it's a characteristic of that specific person, not of Maine. It's not not a shared characteristic among the people. So we're going to go to our palette, trust palette, go back to the agent palette, and we're going to say income. And I'll I'll know it's okay. We're, we're actually not going to accumulate it or anything. It's just. Just in terms of the scale we'll be using, it it, it, it will interpret as a weekly income. Okay. And um, its default value will be zero. Okay. Uh, but we're, we're going to be best on it. Okay. So this is the income. Now, I've told you before, not 10 minutes then, I commented that when we have a parameter in some context, in a constant, like the main, that parameter codes a value and it communicates that value from the point where that construct main is created towards you. Main is created in the scenario. Here, we have a parameter in person. That's going to encode the income for a person. But it's going to also communicate it from the point of creation of that person so that it, it has the right value. Where's the point of creation of the person going to be? I've mentioned it before in Sato Voce. And where is it? Where is it? Where in the model are we going to specify characteristics of people in our give you a hint in our the people in our population population so we're going to go to the population and we will see to some semblance of delight there's actually something we can specify income now it you could be forgiven for thinking oh you just put in a value well it's going to be the same for all agents but you'll notice there's actually this little little thing there and basically it's going to run whatever is here it's going to run it for every agent again and again so it's going to apply it for each agent in turn it's going to use this value each agent in the population how many of them are there well the population size is given by the population size at least initially so we're going to draw from a distribution we're going to type log normal and forgive me for my sins but i'm just going to Hard coded here. Um, log normal. And if you want to know what the parameters are on this, you can do a control space and it will say, okay, it's mu, it's sigma, so that's a log mean, long standard deviation, and then the minimum value it can be. Zero is uh, can never be can never be less than zero anyway. So it's kind of a lack of limit there, but we're gonna draw in short. The weekly income from this from this probability distribution given by this log number. And in any logic, there's this nice kind of thing where you can do log normal and you can kind of see four of five and sigma of two and a minimum of zero, what it kind of looks like, but it's kind of a broad scale here, ain't it? Um, okay. Anyway, um, that's kind of nice. So if I run the model, what will I see? What will happen? You tell me what's going to happen now. If I run this model. So I'm a random income based on that distribution. That's... that's right. That's right. So I'm going to run this model. I'm going to run this here model. And here we go. There we have people in the population. There's population members. And this is a person with a weekly income that's modest, if anything. There's another one with a somewhat larger weekly income that's also on the smaller scale. 
Here's a person with a, you know, a weekly income that affords them something beyond the necessities of life. Right? Okay. Um, and we could go further and we, we might find, you know, uh, all sorts in between, right? There's $400. Twenty five hundred. This one is 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 well healed. Okay. Okay. So so we see this. Um, okay. Um. Now the plot thickens. Does anyone want me to post? Oh, you know what? I I send, and I, and I I will ask your forgiveness. We're gonna save this as V two. I should have called that V one, and I will post. In post, I will. This mall. Post, I shall, and post, I will. Okay. Um, uh, oh, up oh, here. Version two. Okay. And because I called that version two, and, I, and I'm going to go on to version three immediately. Um, Sequence is important, but not necessarily exactly where things um, were divided up. Okay, so I'm going to start modifying this. Okay, so the plot will thicken now. Does anyone remember, where did we specify? Remember, they're, they're arranged randomly in X and Y location, right? Where do we specify how to arrange them? Where do we give the rule for, for giving them a location? Anyone say? Where was that specified? A lot of the art of getting to know any logic is knowing where these things are specified. Where is that? It's in the population. It's specifying the layout for that population. So we're going to go back there. And now we're going to have their X location be given by their, can anyone guess? Their income. Are we okay with this? Hearing no grand objection. We're gonna to have to figure out how to do income, but you, you gotta be careful. Because let's suppose I just said, what, what, what might be the obvious thing to type here? Income, but if you say that it will not be a happy camper, I'll say like, I don't know where income is. Where does income live? In the agent. So we need to say, and this is very specific to, to this context. It's actually something in discrete event modeling where you also use the same thing and you can use it up here as well, but it it's self.income. It just happened. It's not a Java thing. This is how I refer to myself in Java, but you don't want this here because this is main. No, no. This is uh it, it's we want self to refer to that particular agent. It will tell you. See, it says index is the index of this person and the other one is self, so you can use self, and it's self.income, okay? By the way, this is being computed before this, and okay? it's drawing their income before this. In this case, auto completion doesn't work, right? Honestly, I, I'm not sure where auto completion exactly works. Uh, self. Uh, no, it doesn't, doesn't seem like that. Uh, I find auto completion support to be at best incomplete. <laughs> and it's idiosyncratic. Sometimes it's non-reproducible. Okay, so here we have a population. And does its layout look the same or different? Sorry? It looks different Yeah, and, and why is it why is it different? So so what what distinguishes it from what it was before? Hmm? What's different? Can anyone say what what appears different? It's getting denser in the left. Good. Why is it denser in the left? What is their what is setting their x location? Their income. Right. This is pattern produced by randomly drawing on. Uh, they're at, well, on the 
for their y location, but their income is dictating their x location. So who are the people way over on the left-hand side? Who are the people who are crowded onto the left? People with lower income. Who's way over on the right-hand side? Who's the right wing? <laughs> so like what does it say musk or something um <laughs> um you get my trail right um okay um i think one of them was orange not mistaken except that one is pretending to be on the <laughs> that is actually my dad is moving left <laughs> anyway um um anyway um yeah so um um i'm a dual citizen i'm a lawyer too. <laughs> um uh okay um so um we've set up the bases but now the plot's gonna thicken more because we're gonna put people in networks okay we're going to put them into networks. So we're going to add a parameter to this population from the palette. We're going to add something here. It's going to be called connection distance threshold. So it's a distance threshold by which to judge whether or not to connect a given pair of people. If people, if two people, A and B, two agents, lie within that distance of each other, they're gonna be connected and not otherwise in a network. Mm -hmm. Each person is gonna be in a network. They're gonna have certain connection, potential to zero or more other people. And any two people will be connected only if they are physically proximate to each other as judged by this cutoff. If if their distance from each other is over this cutoff, they're not going to be connected. If it's less than this, less than or equal to this cutoff, they'll be connected. Okay? Okay? And uh, the value for this is going to be 100 units, which, and by the way, you can look at a little scale up here. Each of these little squares, that one, the little squares, this one, this one, each of those is 10. Okay. okay. And by the way, you can set the scale to try to relate it to real world scale, but in this case, it's so stylized. So I, I don't see a point here. Okay. Um, okay. Now, this is gonna be a little bit nifty. We're gonna we're gonna go through a process of adding a network in here. Okay, so we've just set the criteria or implied the criteria set them up okay next we're going to go to main because we're going to have a network that lives in main mark my words okay so we're going to go to main it, all this is occurring in main but we got to go to space and network which we used to use to set their location we're not doing that now we need more flexibility for main we're going but it's still useful for their network and we're going to have it set up a distant space network distant space and guess what the connection range is going to be? Anyone guess? What's the range within which, if the, if two people lie within that distance, we connect them? What's that going to be called? Must have been a good lunch. What what's that? What is it? Remember remember I said we added something to say. Uh, a certain, threshold. yeah, threshold. Good, good. Okay, connection distance threshold. Okay, um, so we're gonna say connection, and uh, UJ, the connection autocomplete UJ. works. No, the connect UJ. No, 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 connect. No, it's better than disconnect. <laughs> right? Okay, connection distance threshold. Okay, we okay with that? Okay. Now, I 
I'm tempted to, to do something more to, to make a point. If I run this model, it turns out that they'll actually have a network, but you won't see it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run it and I'll see if I can sort of wangle it to, to show it to you here. Um but it's you know it so I'm saying secretly there's a network, but you can't see it. But if you go over here and you drill down to each person in the population, here's person one. And you'll notice that they have 76 connections reported here. If you scroll up their connections for person one or 76, here's a different person, all right? This person is 191. This next person has one connection. Imagine all the lonely people, um, right? Um, who's going to tend to have more connections in this model? Higher income people or lower income? Lower income, because they're crowded. They're crowded there on the left side, right? Okay, but we'd like to see that network. Wouldn't you like to see it? Hearing no objections. This is what I'm going to do to show it. So if you go to main, sorry, sorry, go to person. Go to person, you'll find they have connections. That's actually what we were just looking at when we drilled down. We we're looking at their connections. Now, here's the deal. In any logic, you can have people in more than one network. Maybe, for example, you want to consider someone's workplace, you know, network of workplace colleagues, um, and their home network, their, their family. Or maybe you want to consider sexual partners and needle sharing partners, and then a network based on um, uh, professional connections. You can you can capture that. Um, maybe connect, connection between a patient and their, and their physician and any other allied health professionals in their life versus their home. You can have more than one type of connection, but this one is built in. And you know, it's kind of the default one unless you go add more. Um, but you can have as many different networks as, as you'd like. Okay, so if you select connections, um, what you wanna do is you wanna go to animation and you wanna select draw a line connecting agents. Okay, how did I do that? I went to person, not main. Classic rookie mistake is to do this in main. So I'll oh, go do it in main. But that, that's not gonna be helpful unless you have multi yeah anyway it's not gonna be helpful not gonna be helpful anyway um you do it in person and you're gonna draw a line connecting agents it doesn't hurt to look at what's in communication notice that we forwarding information to state charts that come in through this network make use of that because occasionally there's dysfunction like they're not getting messages and it occurs sometimes because this is screwed up and you got to make sure it's forwarded to the right state charts you can choose where to route messages. Anyway, okay. So we we said draw a line connecting agent, and we'll leave it behind behind the agent. Maybe we'll do it on top of the agent. Maybe I'll make it a red network. Can I do it a red network so it'll stand out from the black? Sure. Is that okay? Okay. I frog that. I'm gonna say run. I'm gonna build, and I'm gonna run it now. Okay. And it's, oh, hello. Yes. That be a network. Right? Some of these have hundreds and hundreds of connections to the left. Now, some people sometimes ask me, if I have a network to find a UCI net or in PIAC or in Graph Gaffey or something, can I put it into any logic? And the answer is yeah. It's not, not that hard. Um, uh, we have code to do it for PIAC, um, et cetera, but um, requires a bit of customer, but it's not bad. Um, so up at the, who are these folks way over to the right? 
the, the wealthy folks, and they're in these kind of enclaves, right? These disconnected networks. So it's going to be significant, as it turns out. Okay, so now we got our network. Tempted. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. That'd be kind of cool. Can I show you something that will illustrate properties of this network? And that will be a useful point of reference as we go to the next um, sort of uh, step in this model. Is that okay? A lot of these things are unscripted. But you don't mind if I go off teleprompter, do you? Or you a cat teleprompter. Um, uh, okay. So, okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go down to the analysis palette. We're going to, this is one of the things I want to teach. We're going to put in a scatter plot, which is somewhat confusingly called plot here. Okay. We're going to drag in and plot. Are we okay with that? Are we okay? Oh, what am I doing? That's a rookie mistake. Thank you. It's in Maine. Don't don't do it in person. What am I? Sorry. One of the costs of example three something. Okay, there we go. This is a main. Okay. Okay. Um. Great. So this is gonna be a scatter plot. It's gonna plot different x y values. Okay. We're gonna populate this as a scatter plot where the x slope, the x, the horizontal x, is going to be their income. And the y-axis will be the kind of connection. Are we okay with that? Are you kind of interested in what that looks like? How their kind of connections varies with their with their uh, income? Because it will be relevant for their infection risk. Okay. Okay, so here we go. So what we're going to do is we're going to add an event, which is going to go off and populate this at the start time, because we only, it's only going to uh, be, it's, it's, it's going to be static. It's not going to be a changing network. So I'm going to say, um, uh, display income connection or degree scatter plot. Okay. Instead of saying display, I'm gonna say populate, meaning we're putting the data into it. Populate it. We're putting data in. And it's going to go off once at time zero. Now I, I'm, I'm, I'm skating pretty close to the edge here. I'm looking at Wade because he's probably thinking the same thing. Do I feel lucky today? Um, <laughs> that the actual question in my mind is: Is it computing the network before this event gets invoked? I could set it go off at day one. That's fine. Day zero. I'm, there is an answer to that. Um, I believe it'll calculate the network first, but I'm not absolutely certain. Um, let's 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 give this a try. But uh, if not, I'll I'll have it go up on day one. Okay. In any case, okay. So what we want to do here is, oh, we need to name this plot. It's going to be called 
income degree scatter plot. It's going to plot We're going to do not update data automatically. So under data update, do not data update data automatically. The title of this is going to be um, uh, income, which is going to be a um, versus um, I call it degree centrality. That may not be, I'll say connection count. That's just what some of you may not have encountered social network analysis. So I'm just going to say connection count. For, for me, degrees, and, and for a lot of social science colleagues are familiar with that notion, but basically here it's connection count. Okay. We're not going to go into things. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to reset this plot. And then we're going to go through and add people to it or add add the information from people to it. So um, we will do uh, income degree scatter plot. I think there's going to be a reset. No, refresh. Okay, remove, remove all, um, remove all items from it. Okay. Since we're only going to do it once, I'm not even going to do that. Um, what I'm going to do is loop over each person, the population. We're going to put those curly brackets. Keep you out of trouble. And then we're going to loop through and add that person's information. So we're going to go through each person, the population. Matthews, Amelia, Nona. Larissa, Eric, Jenna, et cetera, one by one. And we're going to give them awards. No, we're going to put them into the scatter. Okay. Um, awards they deserve. Um, okay. So we're going to do income, degree, scatter, what? Dot. Add, oh, oh gosh. Oh, 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 we have to do it with a data set. Okay, wait, 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 knows about this. I forgot. Yes, we have to do it with the data set. Sorry, folks. Okay, fine. We're going to do it with the data set. That's fine. It, it's going to be the same mumble thing, but we need a data set in the white. We have to do data set here. Okay. Um, that's too bad. Uh, I'm doing this unscripted. I, I should probably check. Um, uh, probably the easiest thing to do is with the data set. Um, do you agree, Wade? Yes. Okay, so go to the scatter plot. I'm oh, sorry, go to the agent palette. I'm sorry, no, the, the analysis palette and drag in a data set. Sorry about that. So you go to the analysis palette, drag in a data set, and this is going to be income and degree for of population members. What it likes in brevity, it makes up for an intention of being intentionally revealing. Okay, now this is a data set. We used the data set yesterday. Where did we use the data set yesterday? Anyone remember? And you remember where that was? Uh, histograms. Histogram. And the histogram, we used it in a histogram. We also used it in something. Yeah, there's there's a chart, but but that one was time as the horizontal axis value. Here we don't want that. Here we actually want different pairs of values here. And we want to keep up to. 10,000 latest samples, because we, we want one per person. Okay, there we go. Income and degree of population members, I should call it income and degree of population members data set. Make sure it's 
make clear in your mind it's a data set. Okay, so if we have that data set, it's ready as a vehicle, as a vessel in which we can put these numbers. And then here, we're gonna put numbers into there. We're gonna add to there, to that data set, an X and Y location. What is gonna be the X? So sorry, folks, I'm moving too quick. So this, this plot, originally we had value. And then I realized, oh no, you need a data set. So I said, okay, do that. I created a data set here, okay? Um, and I unchecked, I gave it the right name and I unchecked this, okay? And then now I'm gonna populate it. So I, I went back here. And so I say, hey, this data set that I created, I auto-completed it, add these successive pairs of values, X and Y locations. What is the X location gonna be? You can read it off the name, income. Whose income? We're adding this for each person in the population called P. Whose income? P's income. How do we say that? How do we say it in Java? P dot income. It's like P's income. Income. What's the other thing we have to ask? We have to add their, their degree central, the count of their connections. That's what degree means. So P dot And it's something like connection count. I, in my youth, uh, I would know this. Um, get connections number. Get connections number. There. Well, why do we need these open paren, close paren? Why do we need that? Because we're calling this thing on a person. We're saying, get me your number of connections. So that gives us a count of connections. This gives us their income. We're calling, we're saying this data set, hey, add the, this pair of information to that data set there. Are we okay with that? So we're we're going through, we're adding these values to this, these pairs of values of income on the one hand and kind of connections on the other to this data set in turn. And that's adding them um, into this data set. And are, so, do people want to see that more? Do people want this on the big screen? Do you want me to like zoom in on this? And we can't zoom in on any logic on these things because they don't have a nice way of, that I'm aware of to sort of make the font really big. But what I can do is I could call up a tool, probably like what Notepad or something. Notepad plus plus, something like that. Um, and I could probably make this on a high level of zoom. Here we go. Zoom in, mumble, zoom out. Oh, there should be a better way to do this. Fine. Um, view, zoom. Oh, control, num, plus. Oh, okay. So num plus. Control num plus plus on the number. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. Yeah. So it's it's like this. For each person in the population, this is kind of the collection. Okay, I say in this population, for each person in it, named P, add to this data set, which data set? This one right here, this here data set, add a pair of things. What's the first item of the pair? It's their income. What's the second item of the pair? It's their count of connections. We're going to add it to this data set. Do we need a semicolon? Why? Because we're saying what? Do it. Do it. Right? It does something. It changes something by doing this. It's a command. It's a statement. I'm going to add it to the data set. 
Do you want this up there longer? Remember, autocomplete is your friend. Maybe you view lack of autocomplete as your enemy. I don't know. Anyway, do you, are you okay with this? Okay. Now, we have one final thing to do. We haven't wired up this to this data set. Remember, building these models is about connecting these pieces we add. So we have to specify what the data set is here that on which this depends. What is the data set on which the scatter plot depends? Can anyone say? Yeah, it's the income versus degree. So income and degree of population members data set. Are we okay with this? Now, again, there's a, what we call a race condition. Like it's, oh, wait a minute. And then we have to display up to 10,000 latest samples. Um, any logic has these kind of bizarrely constrained like defaults for these things. And it leads to these kind of artifacts that I find really unhelpful. I, I think it may be somewhat misguided thought that can't waste memory on that. But the truth is, those things are not the big ticket items most of the time, unless you have them within a person or whatever. Anyway, um, I was putting like these data points in there and just. <laughs> I imagine, yeah, I've never. I had I've, a student do that once. <laughs> I said, oh, it doesn't matter. Just make it slightly larger than the data size. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's. It, it does eventually. <laughs> right. I, I, would I would imagine. I've never sought to poke the bear, you know, <laughs> deliberately. Okay. Okay, so let's let's build this. Oh, oh my God. build build early, build often. Make sure it's a happy camper. And now build it, and then run it, run early, run often. This is race condition. We don't. We actually don't know which will be computed first. It may be that it. So both the data set and the graph have a maximum number of points. Yeah, I know. I I changed both. Oh, you got both. Points. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, now this is. Actually, taking a somewhat annoyingly long time to kind of, uh, it, it's being it's being a slow on my computer to sort of. Um, I I think we might want to shrink the connection range or think shrink the yeah oh, okay okay so so this is populated um but it's um. But uh, there's an option which I didn't select or unselect to connect points. I should have deleted those points. So let me, let's go back. I think it's here and it's down in the appearance. So I should have dealt with this um, earlier, um, but it was buried in one of these accordion menus. So we, we're selecting it and I think it's in appearance um, and you wanna unselect draw a line. And I, I, I like turquoise a lot, but I think I'm going to do, call me old school, but I'm going to do black. You, you can pick, take your pick. So what did I do? I went down to appearance and I unselected draw line. And now I'm going to run it again. And it'll take a while. And... and here we go. There's this uh, data set. Do you see that? So what is this saying? What's at very low incomes? What? Roughly, what range of populated of number of counts do you have? At very low incomes. Yeah, two ish hundred. Yeah, something like that. Roughly, and then by the time you get up to 
like twenty five hundred dollars per week, which is pretty darn well healed. Um, you you get down to you know very few connections, right? Now, maybe what we'll do is we'll constrain that plot to only show up to about ten thousand income. So I'm going to go back to that plot. We're going to go to scale. We're going to go set the horizontal scale to be between zero and 5,000. Mm. Okay. Okay. And I wanna run this now, okay? And I'm thinking about constraining the network number of connections because it's taken a long, long time to connect this. Thing. And kind of understandably, we have, we have, you know, just incredible, incredibly large number of connections because they're going out of hundred points. So it looks something like this. This is the, this is the connection distribution, as it were, um, uh, associated with uh, different incomes, okay, or or. It's a, it's a it's a scatter plot here, and you can see that it's pretty well inversely correlated with with income, but in a nonlinear way, right? It's not not like you double income and halves halves it. It's it's quite nonlinear. It almost it looks hyperbolic. Um, okay, maybe we'll we'll tweak the default distance connection threshold. Forgive me, but I'm going to make it half its value. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try it um, so that you don't have to. But it, if it if it looks decent, I'm going to I'm gonna decree that that will be the one we use. Um, certainly, um, a lot a lot more reasonable. Now we go up to about eighty, right? Um, just short of eighty. It's a lot more sort of mobile. We get these disconnected groups a lot earlier, um, but maybe, maybe we'll we'll try 70, 75. We'll have a little bit of a balance there. Um, forgive me, I'm, I, I should probably plan this out um, a little bit better, better but um, just wanna see what that looks like. Okay, so we got a, okay, that's kind of seems like a better balance. Okay, so we'll do it at 75. The default will be 75. And this is what the connection range looks like. So again, it's nonlinear. And there's a lot of things in the world that are nonlinear relationships, right? Um, a linear analysis would not capture the shape of this. If you did a linear regression, it's not going to uh, directly capture that. Okay. Okay. So we've got our network. We've got spatial layout. Spatial layout is dependent on characteristics. But we lack some features. We lack guidance, right? We're going to put in place dynamics, and that dynamics will link people together. People's evolution will be bound to them, right? Through the network. And it's to that task that we will bend our backs following the break. So uh, I propose that we reconvene here in 10 minutes. I believe, well, someone can check. Is there is there food been delivered? Okay, good. So we'll break. You can um, avail yourselves of the refreshments and the snacks. And let's come back here in 10 minutes. And we're going to get people talking to each other over the network. And we're going to provide a substrate for them to interact and to, in this case, infect one another, okay? So um, uh, reconvene in 10 minutes, thank you. Oh, I'll post this model forthwith. So uh, before I depart this room, I am going to save this and I will post it Version three of crowding disparities. Excellent. It is posted and available.
for your pleasure. Thank you. Zoom the recording. Great. So uh, for those recalling this, um, we've been building up a model um, that involves networks and um, heterogeneity according to location. We could readily add to aspects of heterogeneity, right? Someone's immigration status, someone's uh, uh, gender identification or sex, um, someone's occupation, what have you. But um, we always, models are like maps. They're useful for particular purposes and that purpose dictates the level of detail required on any one thing. Here we're wishing to capture aspects of socioeconomic status and particular income-based disparities and understand how that's manifested in the burden of, uh, in this case, infection-related uh, health, um, health issues. Um, to capture that, we're going to be adding some dynamics to a person. And this dynamics will reflect the context in which people are located. In this case, their network. Their network here is in some sense secondary to their location, which is given by their income. So here we're using space not as a physical construct. We, we're, it's not a geographic model. We'll be seeing those in a later session. Very nice, some very good, very basic support in any logic for geographic models and integrating geographic information systems. But here space is more stylized quantity which captures location. We're capturing the kind of stylized fact that people who are in lower incomes are often subjected to higher levels of crime. And we're gonna capital the, capture the ripple through effects of the income via crowding on spread of infection and thereby health. So let us bend ourselves to this task. So, um, Interestingly, most of our work on this model thus far has lain in or has been focused on the main environment for this model. And we wish now to turn our attention to matters uh, at the individual level and particularly uh, involving the natural history of infection and transmission uh, of a communicable disease. So to that end, we will switch to person here. And a person has been thus far recommended purely by a few characteristics. By their income, by the location, it's dictated by some random factors. And secondary to that, their their network connections, right? Um, they also have an appearance upon the world. But we're not going to lend them dynamics in the form uh, as encoded by a state chart. Okay. Um, so we're going to add in a simple state chart. Um, well, we can go back to our agent palette, familiar hopefully by this point. We're going to add in states in that. And to make that a bit easier for you to see, I'm going to zoom in again um, uh, with, with an eye towards uh, uh, known as helpful injunctions about making the state chart more easily visible. So I'm going to drag in uh, a state chart entry point. And uh, what we're going to do here is we're calling it infection state chart. Now I'm going to depart from script a little bit, and um, and I'm going to have a little bit more of articulated thing because I want to I want to show you some additional characteristics. So uh, the first state is is going to be fairly predictable, and it's going to be a susceptible state. And um, per our discussion yesterday and uh, or Monday. 
we're going to color that in accordance with its visual color. This changing this visual color here in the state chart doesn't by itself change their color as they evolve over time. But it's helpful as a convention to encode it here in the state chart and, and use the corresponding color at runtime because it allows for quickly cross-checking what is one color to what state does a color correspond. So we're gonna make the susceptible state long green. And then we're gonna go and we're gonna have a infected set of states and then a recovered state, okay? And, and this side is, is a little bit, gonna be a little bit more involved because we're gonna make use of what's called the hierarchical state. And Wade is gonna help me wrangle that to my goal. So um, I'm going to um, have um, a um, infected, I'm gonna have something called infected, um, uh, infected um, here. And we're gonna expand this into sub pieces. Uh, specifically, it's gonna be a latent state of infection. And then there's going to be a state of symptomatic or, or well, more, more, more notably than that, um, a state of uh, infectivity, infectiousness, from which transmission will be possible. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna, this. so I'm going to drag, oh, let's make this a bit wider to be fitting for the, for the um, contents that it will hold vessel-like, okay? So often it, it is helpful when dealing with state charts to have sort of uh, compound, what are called compound states. I'd like to refer to them as hierarchical states, but a state that groups together other states. And I, I commented on this yesterday, but I thought I'd enact it. So what I did is I created that bigger state and then I dragged in another state on top of it. And any logic can be a bit finicky here. And that's why I invoked Wade's name um, in a uh, kind of uh, uh, prophylactic fashion. So I'm gonna call this latent, uh, uh, so a latent infection, a state, first state within it. And the other state with it, I'm going to call infective. And what's notable is that both of these are states of being infected, but it's only from the infective, infective state that one is contagious, that one, one can transmit infection, okay? That one is infectious. And then I'm going to have a state here that's going to be uh, uh, recovered. Recovered and immune. Um, that's going to be gray. Gray. And then we're going to have a set of transitions here. Now, there's many contexts in which there'll be really nice interplay between like, um, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm already uh, have, have neglected a big part of, of uh, hierarchical state charts. What we really need is what's called an initial state pointer here. So if they come into the, to this hierarchical state, it knows where to go. Um, but we can also have an arrow directly into this, right? Um, and and that's that's no problem. But we do need an initial state pointer within this. So if you were to instead have this go here, um, it would it would uh, know to to have them enter here. So this this would also be a acceptable rendition. And in a way, it's less coupled. So I think I'll leave it like that. Wade, do you see any problems with that? No. Oh. And then we'll have one from this state. Now, so I, I want to explain the semiotics here a little bit, okay? Um, so, so we have this overall state called infected. 
and that is a that that reflects a, a joint sort of grouping a, it reflects a, a collection or class of states um, that consist of latent and infected. When you come into, you, you can have things directed to this outer state, in which case they will by default go to the to where the inner, this pointer, this initial state pointer points within the state. Um, you could alternatively have them go directly to a state in here, if you so please. Now, uh, I've, I've elected to do it this way. That kind of decouples. I'm not not hardwiring it to get a latent. I can, you know, if I later add a pre-latent state or something weird like that, um, I, I could easily change that. Kind of decouples them. But this is a little bit optional. I could I could additionally do something like this. Um, it'll be identical semantics right now. One's this one's a little bit more flexible because I can change things where this is routed, and it'll be a happy camper. This is, by contrast, this, if I have this link here, and, and probably just to complete the thought, I'll put this, put this here between them, just so you're not terribly confused. This link out of infected means if you're in this state, you can transition here. By contrast, if I had this, the implications are rather different. What would this mean? Anyone want to say? What would, what would it mean if I had a transition from this entire hierarchical state out, what would it mean? Anyone want to venture a guess? Sorry. Yeah, so in either of these states, I could leave via this route. So it, it, it's kind of like a, a much less busy way, much more elegant, factorized way of a lot of, of having a transition from there to there and another one from here to there. Um, it, it, it sort of captures the fact that we could leave from either state if we did this. In this case, we actually want it to come from this later state. But, you know, you, you could imagine con, you know, constructs where not everyone is in the state goes on to that. And so we want to allow a transition on. So why would we create a hierarchical state? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, because logically there's this grouping of sets of states that we'd like to capture as an abstraction, as a kind of a, a natural unit. Secondly, we can ask things like, is the person, remember that in-state thing we used before? We like to ask in-state current smoker. Remember that yesterday? How could you forget, right? Um, or in-state, are they in-state heart disease or whatever? Here, it was a bit traumatic, perhaps. That's what I'm saying. How could you forget? Um, we, we used it quite a bit. Um, here we can ask, are they in the state infected? And it would apply for either of these states in there. So it kind of allows us to decide and extend the richness of this description um, without having to change all the all the the code that depends on this. If if our concern is like counting the number of infected people, we don't have to count the number of this one and the number of that one and add them up. We can just count the number of infected people, for example. Another key thing is that you can get this nice kind of uh, shared experience where instead of having links from each of these, we have it from the outer state. Those are the main things I look to for a hierarchical state. It, it kind of neatens up our thing. It captures a, a, a hidden concept or a, sort of a, a shared higher level structure. It allows us to have fewer transitions. It allows us to have one test instead of many, one transition instead of many. Um, and as a kind of natural pleasing grouping. So I'm trying to parse this diagram visually, recognize, oh, those are all the different states of infection. Those are some reasons I use them. But wait, do you want to comment on this? Uh, yeah, like you can, 
you can do some tricky things sometimes with these, like uh, mm. like having some out of the outer state and in the particular one. And so oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. And it, it's yeah. You could argue that that's maybe bad because it's 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 parsimonious, but but you have to think about what it's exactly. Doing. Yeah, you can also do something like this where like while you're in the, any of these states, something will be happening over time. Yeah. So, so this means don't, don't, don't leave any of the states you're in, but make this thing happen every one day exactly on the clock, just like Big Ben, this will, this will be firing off if you're in any of these states. And that's rather more elegant than having to do it for each state independently within there. It applies at, at a natural level of sort of description that that this thing could happen any time in there, um, which is is rather pleased. And I think Wade was saying something. Yeah, you can have sort of a you you can have some sort of transition from the outer one to a specific one. So where do you see these hierarchical state charts? I actually see them quite a bit. But one way is you might have undiagnosed and diagnosed in the infective state. Right. This is related to some of Jarrett's, you know, uh, comments yesterday. You might have like a state of heart disease. Anyone is in that state has heart disease, but then within that there are two. There are two substates, undiagnosed and diagnosed, and you could represent that as a separate state chart. But if someone doesn't have heart disease, it's not really meaningful to talk about them being diagnosed, but. They could be substates of the heart disease state, whether they're diagnosed or undiagnosed. It's really quite elegant. You also get it for different stages of infection, you know, pre-symptomatic, um, mildly symptomatic, severely symptomatic, pulmonary TB. You could have different stages and you can recover from any of them via common transition out maybe, um, but you can transition within here. But you can ask, is someone TB infected or something? And it will, it will, it will, uh, it will give an answer for if they're in any of those states. So it's it kind of captures the a natural mode of description. Are we okay with this? Okay. So I want to show that, but let's let's make use of it. So thus far, I. Don't worry about the timeouts. That, that was a distracting thing. I just left them as timeouts for our discussion. We want to change them to other things. So first, we're going to do the easier things. So um, we're going to go to Maine. We're going to have this be dictated by a certain mean time of infection. And we're, we're going to have a mean, mean latent period for this one. Okay, mean infectious period, mean latent period. So let's go, let's go to Maine. We're going to share those values across all people. You can make them by, vary by individual, but let's start simple. Walk, build up a simple model before we, and learn from it before we elaborate. So we're gonna have mean latent period. Now, we wanna make sure we're saying something that is sensible. This is, time unit is days. So it's natural when we say three, it'll be three days, right? We'll say that it'll be a mean latent period of maybe three. Uh, why not? Okay. 3.0 days by default. And then we're going to add in a mean infectious period. Per Jeff's question earlier uh, from this morning. Maybe the mean infectious period will will we'll have... Um, 14 days to remain infectious. That's a, that's a long period, but we'll do it. Okay. Um, regarding Jeff's questions, those might be the sort of things that uh, are estimated based on clinical studies of individuals, right? Um, so an individual who we know is re recently infected, um, based, maybe they're hospital, uh, they're infected whilst in hospital through a nosocomial infection, a hospital acquired infection. With this, we know when they were encountered because it was a nurse who had the infection. And so we measure how long they remain latently infected when they reach levels of 
viremia that they might transmit or what have you. Um, or if you had an incubation period that was the same as the latent period, we might look for signs when their symptoms appeared. So in the clinical literature, you might find estimates like that. Okay. Okay. So we have in Maine now a mean latent period, a mean infectious period. And rather than making these timeouts that are exactly that time, I want to have it be a rate such that that rate has an average time given by those values. So this one latent here will be completing latency will be the name of the transition. What it lacks in beauty, it makes up for in transparency. Um, and it's going to be a rate. What is that rate going to be? One over main dot. You got it. One over main dot mean latent period. There we go. If we if we have a rate, maybe we'll say if that's the only transition out, well, your your average time in that state, your mean time in that state will be one over the rate. Or alternatively, if we have a mean time, your rate will be one over the mean time. It's a property of the exponential distribution. And, and that's a reflection of its so-called memoryless transition status. It doesn't matter how long you've been there. If you're still there, your chance of leaving, your kick of the can for leaving in the next day, let's say, is the same, no matter how long you've been there. Okay. That's in contrast to a timeout transition. Infective period, we're going to do the same thing. So this is going to be called a recovery transition. And we're going to show the name. And the recovery transition is a, can be associated with a rate. And the rate is going to be 1.0 divided by main dot mean what? infectious period. Now you might ask, well, wait a minute. I I not only have mean estimates of that, I actually have a distribution. I have some, you know, there's a long tail on the upper side. I actually have data estimates of, 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 of a mean standard deviation. Or it's a log normal distribution with this log mean and long standard deviation. Could I how can I capture that? This is a memoryless, this is an exponential distribution. I had it, you know, drawn up here on Monday. How do we capture this? Well, we could leave it as a timeout and draw it from a distribution, parameterized accordingly, draw it from a, a, a probability distribution given, or by an empirical probability distribution through what's called the, and I think it's under the agent palette, but um, a custom distribution function. We'll show that at one point, but we'll walk before we run, okay? Okay, so make sure you can build this, that it's a happy camper. Now, right now we haven't really hewed to our, our goal of making the color um, consistent with our runtime goals. So we're going to make this yellow and we're going to, maybe we'll make it orange. How about orange? Because it's like impending danger. Code orange. Okay. Um, mumble. Is this orange? Looks like kind of. Okay. Or, or, orange. Orange. Like this? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, mumble. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay. Wait, but. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Thanks. That's great. And for this one, I'll make it red. Okay. Okay. Ready for this? Okay. Now, what I would argue is we haven't enacted these colors. I could run, if I run these. If I ran this thing, would I see people changing colors? Why not? Because I haven't, I haven't actualized it, right? I haven't realized it. I haven't 
I even operationalized this. I mean, the, 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 these are nice visual colors for understanding the diagram, but really we want to translate these into what how it appears. So what do I do to tell it what color, to what color I want within a state chart? Anyone remember, remember that? We did it on Monday. What, what did we use? We used a variable because it needs to vary with the state that they're in which they're located. Are we ready for this? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to use a variable. Where does this variable live? Does it live in Maine or at a person level? Person, because it's encoded for that person, what color to make them, right? So the color is going to be the, I'm going to call it infection color. You, you can criticize me. And perhaps rightfully you should, because before I call it like boundary color, I could call it like figure color because it's a little thing there, but I'm going to call it, forgive me, I, I, I lapse perhaps, but but I, I kind of alternate between give it a name based on the role it plays, like what's used to calculate it versus based on the, the visual thing that it, it's going to determine. I'm, I don't know. I, do, you, do you want it like figure color? Would that be better? Because it's going to call color the figure? Okay. No one prefers figure color. So I'm going to call it figure color. Um, by figure, I mean this, this kind of figurine, this anthropomorphic image. And I prefer not to say anthropomorphic image color. <laughs> okay. We have enough, enough issues with whether there should be a U. I don't want to get into that. Okay. Okay. And this is what, what is its type? Color. There ain't no choice. Okay. And its initial value will be black. Okay. Are we okay with that? Okay. Okay. How do we, how do we make that be how do we set that value to be our color when, when we're in this state? Where do we put it? Where where do we put it? Yeah, enter the state. Yeah, enter the state. What do we do? We're building muscles. Charles Anderson was his muscle muscle man or something. Um, yeah, Atlas, Charles Atlas or something. And he said. They asked him, how did you get big muscles? And he said, I exercised my 64 pound weakling muscles. So we're exercising some, some muscles here. What do we type there? Figure color. And equals what? Line, you could see it, it's called line. There it is, line. And then do we need a semicolon or not? We do, because <laughs> what are we saying? <laughs> Do it, do it, okay, okay. Okay, and for this one here for late, what do we do? We change this to be orange, I'm copying it, right? Saying, say it's equal, right? So Michelle Obama had a rousing ordering. She had people saying, do something. That's what we're telling it. Like, do something. That's why this is semicolon. Now. She didn't mention that in her talk, but she'd probably agree. Okay. Um, and then this is red. And this is gray. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Let's make sure it builds. Okay. So if we ran it now, would we see it change in colors? Well, no, you got to tie it to the figure. You got to tie it to the figure. It's a couple steps. These are computational mechanisms. We need this pathway. We need this pathway. To finish the job, we need to go here. And there's the rub. <laughs> because you wonder why you begin with ovals. And it's not just because they're possessed of platonic beauty. 
though that be true? Um, it's because they're actually easier to color. <laughs> and well, to do this, it's it's not that bad, but you, you need a bit of frobbing. May I show you how to frob it? That means tweak it. Well, actually, it doesn't. It means more than tweak. So I'll tell you what. I don't want to divert too much. So the, the MIT Tech Model Railroad Club developed a lexicon, the first hacker's lexicon. You can find you can find it encoded if you look at the hacker's dictionary. You can find it by Eric Freeman. Um, and uh, one of the things they had is is different names um, for like changing things. So. You, 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 it went from on a scale from like tweaking something. No, actually, it was less than tweaking. A tweak, twiddle, frob, and uh, there's actually, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, they differentiated based on how random it was versus how like careful it was. Frobbing was kind of, you know what you want, but you're changing it in bigger ways. Twiddling was kind of pointless, like. <laughs> like changing things uh it, you're you're just like trying it out you're not sure tweaking is like fine-grained adjustment based on some goal and i think there was like i can't remember what the the big one was so it's like you you just like <laughs> you just knock it or something anyway um there's different levels of that okay so hacker's dictionary look it up Okay, so here we have this anthropomorphic figure and I need to show you how to change it, okay? So here's the trick. Um, th there's a couple ways to do this. I find this one the best, others can reasonably disagree. I go to person and you'll find that in addition to all these things being shown in the canvas, you can actually see them in this projects window under this. So in the presentation, well, there's only, You'll find the state chart here, for example, and all the pieces of it here. It's kind of nice if you want to select one, you can do that. But the thing we want to focus on is this guy here, this here anthropomorphic figure. And if you open presentation, you'll find it. And there's a person. And then there's a thing called shape body, which, you know, sounds like a Jack LaLanne advertisement or something. Uh, I guess you folks are too young for me. Um, uh, <laughs> wow. so, so, um, uh, I think Jared got it. Um, maybe it's only a U.S. thing. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, there's shape body here. And, uh, if you go into position of shape body, um, there's a thing called fill color and line color. Okay. And do you remember how to set these via a variable? You have to change it from equals to this kind of twisty thing. Okay? And we're going to have it set by figure color. And I'm going to set both of them, the line color and the fill color for now to be that. Okay? Okay. Okay, shape body. Okay? Okay. Okay. Okay, now if we run this model, will we see it change color? I pause it, we will. Let's build it. Anyone want to see anything I did? Anyone want to not see anything I did for the rest of your life? <laughs> okay, okay, let's run this thing. If it builds, great. If it doesn't build, uh, ask a TA for help. Okay, we're going to right click on the scenario and we're going to run it okay and it's calculating it's, it's calculated the network predominantly any logics network calculation kind of slow and now we see people with different colors what's going on what's going on there what state is this person in right here they're infected right this person is what state? Late. This person is what state? Recovered. That's what we've called them. But is it really, like, is, is there any way in which one person's transmitting it to another right now? 
No. Everybody gets it on day zero. Everyone gets it on day zero. Why aren't they all going in brutal synchrony and lockstep, as it were? Because these are rate transitions. Some people go before others. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's one key ingredient missing, and we just mentioned that. And that is transmission of infection. There's actually a supporting ingredient we're going to get to, but um, the the key the key you know one that we have to hit in a, in a really important way is the transmission of infection. Okay, um, there'll be one thing to ignite it. Okay, so we need to allow. So, so when an infection event occurs, what does it require? It requires two to tango. What does it require? I would argue it requires two people transmit from one to another. But is it just any old two people or is it a particular type of pair of people? What's, it, what's distinguished about their characteristic that allows a transmission event to occur? How about for the person whence that transmission event comes, in other words, from which the transmission event comes. That person needs to be what? It's infectious. How about the person on the receiving end of that trans of, of that that exposure that could transmit infection? What do they have to be for them to get infected? They're going to need to be what? Susceptible. Susceptible. So we somehow need to capture this reality. And I'm going to show you how to capture it, exactly that. What's What may be a bit confusing is it's captured in, in that each of those components is captured in a, in a distinct way, okay? From the receiving end and from the setting. From the receiving end, imagine someone's susceptible. We're going to treat this if they receive a message, okay, an exposure message. Mm -hmm. um, then we're going to uh, it's it's going to allow them to get uh, to get infected. Okay. Um, okay. So it's going to be based on a message transition. You notice the icon there. That's a message, meaning this transition is only traversed if they've received, if they've been exposed to an infection. Do you see that? Do you see that? So we're imagining it, okay, if a person is in the susceptible state, after all, the transitions out of a given state are contingent on being in that state. You're not going to, if a person's in the effective state, you're not going to have have that person go on this transition. They're already here. Only if you're in a given state, only the transitions out of that state apply, right? Um, and, and things that fire off within that state, but but uh, you're not gonna you know, have them oh, wherever. So there's a certain contingency or conditional nature of things. This is only, the, the only people who can go across this are people who are susceptible. So there we go. So that's the receiving end. They have to be susceptible. And that's what this says. If you receive an exposure message, you'll leave that state of susceptible and you'll go into the infected state. And by extension, since the infection state has an entry point here, you will, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing on the screen here, you will go to a latent state. Are we okay with that? Are we okay with that? Okay, next. Name that transition like exposure or something? Good, 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 good. Yeah. Great. Exposure. Is, um, Jared is often one step ahead of me. Exposure. Yeah. Um, we could call it infection because traversing it actually makes the person infected. But later we may make it conditional. So let's leave it as exposure. I like that. Okay. But do remember that, like, if someone is in the latent state, infective state, recovered state, they could get a message sent to them, sent to them, it'll just fall on stony ground. They won't actually get infected by it. 
because they have no they have no message transition out of them. Say that you've got to have a certain amount of exposure build up, and then you could you could it, right it would. Now we're just saying you're guaranteed. Like, right now it's guaranteed. Later we may modify it so that it's a coin flip chance. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, good question. Now, um, so this is exposure or, or infection. If they are in this, they're going to go here if they get that message. Yeah. Um, where is the other? It takes two to tango. One is susceptible. The other is what? You said it earlier. The other has to be Jeff said it. Infected. So somehow there needs to be an infective one. And if the susceptible, very good, Sully. Yeah, that's exactly right. If the susceptible has to be on the receiving end of a message, what does the infective have to be on the what end of a message? Sender. Sending end of a message. And I'm going to show you how you do that. May I do that? Hearing no objections. We're going to drag a transition. Now, this transition may puzzle you. This transition may vex you. This transition could even distress you, but it has a certain logic to it. So I'm gonna to try to describe it this way. This is a transition that will fire when you're in the infective state. After all, it seems to depart from, like it occurs while you're in the infection state. It sources the infective state, but it, you don't leave the state. You stay within the state. You're not leaving it, but it's occurring a certain rate. And this this transition is going to be called um, expose others. Um, yeah. Okay. It is going to be a rate transition with a rate given by a contact rate, okay? And what we're going to do here is, right, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first set this to a value and we'll set it to be a, a parameter in a bit, okay? So I'm going to set this to be a value of, of, of excuse me, a rate transition of one per day, okay? One per day. What does that mean? How many on average occur per day? This is the rate is one. What would the average number per day be? Unit of one, one, one over it, right? So once a day on average, they're going to do something that transmits infection. And that's the question. What do they do? Well, they're on the what end of a message, we said. They're on the begins with S, sending end of a message. So this is what they're going to do. And this is a key line. Arguably, this is the single most important line of code you're going to see today or possibly all week, but, but at least today. Okay. It is going to be this dot, actually, you don't need that, but send, okay? To random connected. And we're gonna send a message, okay? We're gonna send some message. So if you look, when we when we do autocomplete, it will tell us, okay, that we need to send a message. If you, if you started typing this, we we I didn't emphasize it much. I noted it kind of in passing, but if I had send to, you know, and I did this, you'll notice it. It allows me to see information on it. It says send a message. That's the MSG um, to randomly chosen agent in the same environment. Um, and it gives some information and it sends it to people in my network. That's what it means. It's not the same as send to random neighbor, which is in space, um, particularly in a discrete environment. Send to random 
connected here. I, I meant to do this one. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to have a special message name here. So I, I'll send myself as the message. Okay. So I'm going to send to a random person in my network. So it's going to send to one of my connections. So that's the sending end of the message. And the person who gets it will be a different agent. And if they happen to be in this state, they'll get infected. What if they're not in this state? How if the person who receives this, the random one of my connections who receives it is not in the susceptible state? Where, what, what will happen if they're in the latent state or recovered state or infected state? Nothing, nothing. By the way, th there are models. In fact, Wade is a, a master of them. Uh, where like being on the receiving end of a message, even if you're not susceptible, it will it may boost your immunity to get this message. So your immunity is boosted by exposure to chickenpox vaccine, or excuse me, chickenpox virus, the VZV, um uh ver varicella zoster virus. Um your immune system is sort of primed by it. It's it's sort of, um, it it's reminded of the the dangers or the 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 fact this virus is around. It's um, stimulated by it, and it produces protection. So, wait a some uh, an interesting chickenpox model, whereby if you're in the presence of chickenpox after you're immune to it. Being exposed to those messages won't infect you, but it will prime your immune system that will keep it strong until old age and you'll tend not to develop uh, shingles. Whereas if your immunity has waned, you haven't seen it in years and years and years at all. There's been no stimulation. Um, uh, that shingles, the same virus, which has remained dormant in your body lifelong, can reactivate as your immune system is weak and can cause great neurological pain. And... And so there, being exposed to virus during your life actually primes your immune system to avoid shingles, to, to, to be strong enough to avoid shingles. Now, that doesn't mean we want chickenpox circulated. Um, but after all, no one's going to be in this situation of having this issue, except if they were infected by chickenpox early on. But Wade has a very nice paper together with Ellen Rafferty and Alex Doroshenko and so on where uh, he's examining exactly this issue. Um, and there's a kind of a punchline to it, et cetera. Um, okay. Um, so as you can imagine, if you have really, really good uh, chicken box vaccinations, um, there'll be a time where shingles incidence is elevated for a while, um, but then it's gonna decrease below the value it otherwise would have had. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so here we have this theory of transmission. Here's the sending end from someone who's infected, and another person, not the same person, another person who's on the receiving end might be here and they might get infected. But if they're in one of these other states, the person who happens to receive it, they, they'll just ignore it. It won't trigger anything. Are we okay with that? So let me ask this. If we ran this model, with some measure of excitement, perhaps even bated breath, would would we see spread of infection? And why not? What is seeded? We have to seed the infection. There has to be one person infected, at least, in the initial time. Okay? Are we okay with that idea? Okay, now, there's ways to do things with great finesse for a larger number than one. I'm going to send it to an initial person. Okay. Now, sometimes that person could be an isolated person and not won't trigger, but other types, excuse me, they may be in a cluster and they'll, in fact, in their connected component, there are other people that are directly or indirectly connected with them. Okay. We're going to put in place an event called um, initial infection event. I, I I probably could have called that event. So when I see a list, I'll know it's an event, but you, you could you could say I'm just being picky and 
yeah, maybe. Uh, but but I I kind of like like to see when I see names, I like to be able to read off what they are. Oh, sad and said. If you read just initial infection, like maybe it could it would take me a moment. You know, is that a transition? No, 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 that's an event. Yeah, but if I label it event, I know what it is. Okay, what's the action here? What what needs to happen in the initial infection event? It occurs once at time zero, and what needs to happen? We have to pick a, pick a random person and and infect them, right? Okay. Um, so we want to do, and, and there's a couple ways to do this. Deliver to random agent inside is one way to do it. That's kind of a blunt way to do it. You can also pick a random person from the from the population population dot i think it's called random and you can send them an infection um you could you do like send yeah send send um uh yeah mumble there's a there's a version of send that we'll do it i'm going to do that send to Deliver, deliver, I'm gonna do that one I did. Deliver to random, to to um, uh, agent inside. And I'm gonna send them, it doesn't matter what the message is. So maybe I'll say, quote, infected, exposed, it doesn't matter. And before I sent them this, it, it, it doesn't, doesn't matter at this point. Later we'll have messages of different types and there it starts to matter. Because if it's a vaccination message, I'll do one thing, get vaccinated. If it's an exposure message to chickenpox, I'll do another thing. Um, if it's a um, motivational interview message, I'll, I'll undertake behavioral change, whatever. Um, we'll get to that bridge when we cross. I want to cross that bridge when we get to it. Okay. So initial infection event goes off at time zero. Occurs once. Timeout. Remember, we've used events to go off periodically, or we can send them to go off zero, you know, one time. That's what we were doing here. And its job will deliver to random agent inside. Make sure your model builds. Here we go. And I'm going to put it on big screen if anyone needs it up. You can see that's what it looks like. And the message doesn't matter. The, here. It doesn't matter because we only want to have the mess and we're not paying attention. We don't even see that. Are we okay with this? Hearing no objections? Build early, build often. Okay. And you may have to run it more than once because the chance of then it could fall on stony ground, right? It could it could reach a disconnected, and one might add, disoriented and Disconnected, perhaps, from much of reality, Elon Musk. Um, but um, here we go. Why are all these green? Can anyone say? Why are all these people green? Start out as susceptible. They start susceptible. Can anyone see anything happening here? I had to get rid of my lines. Look at this. Look at this. Could you see yeah. something happening now? Oh, yeah. Put the lines behind. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you could put the lines behind them. How would we do that? Well, we go to person. That's where we set their, whether or not their network is shown. We go to connections. So if we want to put the lines behind, go to person, canvas, go to connections, and you go down to the animation area and you choose draw behind agents. I want to show it initially because I wanted to make it the, the uh, network obvious. But doing it behind agents will give primacy to the agents, and, and therefore you can see their stat eye as the status of them more more readily. So here we go, and um, and then we'll see if anyone in this connected component happens to get infected. Um, did it did it not have trigger in this connected component? Maybe there's a gray one in the upper. Oh, yeah. So maybe they recovered yeah. before. Okay, I'm going to run it again here because that was a lucky a lucky draw. It actually occurred in a crowded tenement, but um, 
Okay. Okay. Oh, look at that. There's a person. Okay. Now it's okay. Is it going to go to this one or is it going to recover first? Okay. This one's under high infection pressure. Okay. Oh, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Now we're in trouble. Now we're in trouble. It's going to get off this small component. It's spreading here. Okay. Oh, look, it's blocked this way. Oh. <laughs> okay. It died out, right? Okay. It saved the population. Okay. Well, um, we've got a running infection model. But now, yeah, lucky model. Okay. Are people good continuing here? Are we good? You want, why don't I save this model? Save this model away. It's version four. I'm going to post it. And does anyone want to break for five minutes? Anyone online or, or here? If not, we'll continue applying our trade. Anyone? Does anyone need it? A break? Okay, break for five. Okay, we're, we're back at 23 past. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna pause the uh, recording. And we'll be back with the remote folks in five minutes. Thank you, Wade, for for your producing some posting. That's great. Okay, I'm gonna pause for. Okay. So we're we've been building up this model. We have, so to speak, ignition on the model. Um, uh, and what I'm going to seek to put into place here is some um, additional refinements on this that will give us some, some insights here, okay? Um, so uh, first of all, um, we're going to have characteristics of uh, particular people, um, which are going to record for that person, their contact rate, which can be different across people, just like they can have different income. And there can be interventions that affect some people's uh, contact rate successfully and not others, um, because it may not reach others. So at a person level, we're going to put in place something called the, the contact rate, okay? And its initial value is actually going to be 2.0, not, 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 not 1.0. It's actually it's initial value. I, I, do you want to expunge that from your memory? I'm operating with half a deck today, and this is, this is um, a consequence. So I, I misspoke. That's not their, it's not its initial value, it's its uh, default value, if nothing else specifies it. We'll get to that in a moment. But we're going to make the contact transition here depend on that parameter. So what do we need to type for the rate? Anyone? Contact rate. Good. Contact rate. Okay, now, we will further put into place, well, you tell me, where is the contact rate to apply for a given person going to be specified? It's a parameter person, so it's specified wherever the person is created, the, the construct responsible for creating that, that person. And where is that located in the model? Sorry? It's there. It's in the... It's in Maine. It's in the population in Maine. Lower was sort of saying, yes. That's exactly right. Okay. So if we go to the population in Maine, 
we'll find that it's there, we can specify the contact ring. Now, forgive me, but I'm I'm going to add a thing called default contact ring, which will be sort of the default one. <laughs> and if if an intervention doesn't specify it, and it will be 2.0. This is in Maine. This is in Maine. That's the one that will apply initially to most people and to everyone. And then we're going to have later, if they end up getting influenced by an intervention, we'll have them use a smaller contact rate by <clears throat> setting the parameter value to that thing, which you can do. Actually. Okay. So the default contact rate is 2.0. And the population is actually this population is going to, for the contact rate for an individual, guess what it's going to use by default? The default contact rate. Contact rate. You may think that's real twisty-like. Um, and I could understand why it seems that. But later, we're going to have interventions that set on an individual level what contact rate applies. So this is just setting everyone on an even playing field with contact rate. What's that? Zoom in. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Now we are doing this and going by default contact. Okay. Now, we're going to prop one or two more things. Prop is kind of with a goal in mind, but it's a bigger, it's a it's a significant change, not just a, a sort of um, tweak. It's more than a twiddle, but it's 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 less very it's sort of random than a twiddle. Um, okay, so we're going to have a link. Uh, a transition from recovered to susceptible, okay? So I'm going to drag in a transition from the agent palette to recovered, and it's gonna go to susceptible. Anyone wanna hazard a guess as to what it's, the name of that will be? Yeah, waning immunity. Or we could say waning of immunity. Or you could say immunity waning. You know, this would be good. Okay. Okay. And how do we make it so that that bends around in a more pretty way? How do we prettify it, as we say, computer science? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we'll we'll I'll put it here, okay? Maybe maybe we'll make it a bit more symmetric, but make it something like that. Does that look okay? Real purdy like, okay? And um, we're going to set this to have a, uh, a default uh, duration of immunity uh, that it's, it's going to be, a, excuse me, immunity duration parameter, uh, which is going to be uh, 45, okay? Um, I think we'll put that at the level of, is there a reason to keep this at the level of a person, um, uh, no, I um, I don't see any uh, any reason to keep it at the level of a, of a person. Okay, so we're going to have for the waning of immunity, the duration of it, we're going to have at the, at the shared between all people, and hence in Maine, we're going to have um, uh, mean duration of immunity 
And this is going to be a value of, let's say, 45 days. So, you know, the last I checked, the literature wasn't firm about this, but things like chlamydia and gonorrhea, um, they've, they've quite, these sort of bacterial infections, they have quite short periods of immunity um, often. So I'm going to use one of those, 45 days. Remember the unit of the model. We go look at the model as a whole. The unit is days. Right? So this means that 45 means 45 days. Okay. Mean duration of immunity. That lives in Maine. It's shared between all people. So here, this mean duration of immunity will be a rate transition. And what will its rate be? Sorry? What will its rate be? That's our mean duration of immunity in Maine. What, what, is, what is the rate going to be? We've seen it before quite a few times. One over it. Yeah, the reciprocal of it. One divided by main dot mean duration of immunity. Make sure your model builds. Okay. Are we okay with this? Can we run it again? You may recall from our very first day, when we added a transition to lose immunity, it actually really altered the, the behavior of the model. It, it led to kind of a endemic infection or, or sort of um, percolating around in kind of a, a, a random way at some modest level of infection in the population. And and it, it can have really big effects. Um, so, so it allows the infection to often circulate for large periods of time. And you can see the effect of that here. Before we had it kind of die out, but now it's circulating. Why is that circulating? Why does it continue to circulate? Can anyone tell a story? What, why, what allows it to continue to circulate? by virtue of adding that transition. What is it about this that allows it to circulate, continue to circulate? Resusceptible. Resusceptible, which allows, if there's a nearby wave, them to get infected and they'll, they'll transmit it. And then, yeah, it's, it's, it's a reintroduction of susceptible. So, so susceptibles to serve as kind of the fuel to the fire. They, are, they allow the fire to burn. It requires susceptibles to get infected for it to spread. And so if people become susceptible, it's like you're putting, you know, uh, more fuel into the fire. Okay. I, I don't like to talk about it that way, but that's, that, that's a, you know, a, a pretty good analogy, actually. Okay. Um, but these are human lives. So um, let's, so we've seen this. Um, let's, now let's enjoy um the uh let's let's enjoy the benefits of our work so i'm going to save this it's version it was it was version four i'm gonna so i'm gonna call it version five and i'm gonna post it as version five but i should have yeah i i, I i've done this in our play so I'm going to call it version and start modifying it as version six now. So we, here we go. Okay. Okay. Not doing this in a good way. Okay. Anyway, so we're going to have version six. I posted version five there. Okay. So I posted the latest one. If anyone wants to get it. Okay. So now we want to enjoy the fruits of our labor. But first we want a few ways of summarizing it. So how am I going to put in place a, a report on the count of people who are infected. Anyone? Well, let's say the count of people who are infected. How would I do that? How would I do that? Sorry? Main population statistics. Excellent. Main population statistics. So that's a cross-sectional thing. We're just reporting on... Number. So we're going to say count 
infected. What type of statistic is it going to be? Is it going to be a sum, an average, a min, or a max, or might it be a count? What do you think by its name? Okay. Um, and what's the condition that we count? That they're what? How do we know they're infected? Because they're in the infected kind of compound state, right? And notice I don't have to add together what's the count infected, what's the count infected, or what's the count latent, what's the count infective. No, I just ask, are they in the infected state? Count agent dot in state. Remember that? In state. And what do we need? I can't just say infected. What do I need to say before this? Remember? Remember what we have to say? Person dot infected, because there might be service dogs in here and they could get infected too, or there might be physicians, they could get infected, or what have you. Okay. Okay. There might be dairy cows and there might be people, and each of them have an infected state, but we need to say which one we're counting. Okay. So I just built it. Are we okay with that? Now, we've done many times, we're exercising. Muscles we've exercised many before. May I ask you to tell me how to add a plot, a time plot, which plots out over time the number of people who are infected? What do I do? What do I do? Palette analysis. Good. Palette analysis. Yeah. Time. time plot indeed. And here we go. We have a time plot. And okay, um, there we go. And this time plot is going to be called um, uh, infection time plot. I'm going to fairly label that fairly generically, and it's going to count the number of infected individuals right now. Are we plotting a value or a data set? A value. And how do we get the value? How do we get the count of people who are infected? Where does that live? Jeff guided us to it before. Where does it live in the model? It lives in the, where did we add that statistic? To the what? Did we add it to, to the state chart? Did we add it to the scenario? Where did we add it? Where did we just add the statistic? To what did we just add the statistic? To the, begins with P, ends with N. It has a L in it and another P. Population, thank you. Population dot count infected, right? Hmm? Built early, build up. So I'll, I'll call it count infected. Right now it says infected, but I'll say count infected. Okay. Are we okay with that? Can you build? Who needs TA help? The TAs are yearning to be useful. Okay, I'm gonna run it. Here we go. Come on. Come on. Come on, come on, scroll, scroll. Here we go. Here's income versus connection count, but our, our real graph that, in which we're interested is above this. Oh, there it is. We, we went too far. Here we go. Count infected. Okay. Okay. 
Is it going to go up and come down to zero? Do you think? I mean, it could. It could. <laughs> but the likelihood. The likelihood is small. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to oscillate. It looks like it oscillates around here. Now we could deal with this visual dysfunction, but I think you get the drift there. We could set the the things, and I I do want to uh, wrap this up soon. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do um, put in place a more interesting graph. That, I mean, that's interesting. I don't mean to, I don't mean to, um, uh, to cast dispersions. It's, 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 uh, it's interesting, but this is what I want to do. I want to keep track for each person, the number of times they've gotten infected. How would I do that? You tell me. Person, create a variable. Excellent. Initial value zero. Good. Yep, because it's the kind of times that person has got infected. So it's not shared across all people. So it it's going to vary over time. So it's a variable. And so we're, we'll say count, count times infected. Right? Okay. You could say it's not, it's not a terrible name. What sort of type is it? Is it a double? Is it a color? Is it a person? It's an int. It's an int. It's a count. What is it going to start? What's it? What's its starting value? A variable has to start with some value. What is it? Zero. Good. What is it that increments it? What is it that adds to it? What is it that leads it to be one higher? The occurrence of what? Speak on. What is it that leads this to need to be higher for a given person? Entering into an entry. Yeah. Yeah. Transition into infected. So this is where I would say if you called it count times exposed, I would put it on exposure. You put it on right. it, called it count times infected. That's right. That's that's a good thing. Yeah. Infected. Yeah. No, good. Compelling. Yeah. Okay. So what do I put for the entry action of this? It's a good thing. What do I put for the entry action? Bit of code is needed. What is it? Count times, infected, count times infected plus plus. Do I need a semicolon? Because yeah. we're saying what? Do it, right? Do something. Okay. Okay. Now, let's suppose I want to create a histogram. Excuse me. Excuse me. Let's suppose we want to create a scatter plot that summarizes across the model. Each dot will be a person. The X value will be their income. The Y value will be their count of times infected. It's summarizing across the entire population. Where does that scatter plot live? In Maine. Does it summarize it across the entire population? We're almost done. Don't worry. There's also coffee out there. Need it. I certainly do. Okay. Um, okay. So, how do we do a scatter plot? What's our? What do we use to add a scatter plot? Plot. Pardon me, Nona. I'm going to zoom out temporarily. And I'm just going to drop this. And I'll zoom back in. Okay. And this is going, this plot is going to be called um, income. I could say income versus, I kind of like that. I know I didn't do it before, but I, forgive me. Income versus count times infected scatter plot. What is this going to depend on? We did it before and we found we need it to be more savvy. What does it need to depend on? Data set. Yeah, it needs to depend on a data set. 
so we can still title entitle it. So this will be income horizontal uh, versus count times infected vertical vert. Okay. But it's going to depend on a data set. So we have to add our data set. And the data set's going to hold these pairs. So where does that live? The data set lives in also in the analysis palette whence we dragged in this time plot. So we're going to drag in a data set, and this is going to be income versus count times infected. What am I going to end it with per my conventions? Data set. I like its type to be clear to me so I can see what it is because we have many types of things. And, you know, age-based modeling is a big vocabulary you want to see. This data set does not use time as the horizontal axis value. We're storing pairs of values, and I'm going to store up to 10,000 samples. Don't do a billion. <laughs> okay. Okay, we want this plot to depend on that data set. So we've set up this data set, we unchecked this, gave it a nice name, said keep up to 10,000 samples. It's already set to not update data automatically. That's great, we'll be doing it ourselves. Thank you very much. The plot is going to depend on this data set. So we have to put that in there for the data set, income versus count time data set. It could have depend on the data set, not the scatter plot. The scatter plot is itself. Don't have a depend on it. It has to depend on the data set. It should build right now, but it's not done. What still thing do we need to do? There's one more thing we need to do to complete the picture. The we need to populate the data set. We need to do so periodically. Okay, so here's our data set. Oh, sorry. Yeah. We need to add what do we use to do something again and again and again and again, for example. The, the, an event. An event. We're going to go to the agent palette and we're going to drag in an event. And this event will be populate, or I'm going to say update because it's not just one time. It's update income versus count times infected. Scatter plot. We're going to update it. How are we going to update it? Well, we're going to update it every so often. So we can set here. It's going to be a. It's going to be a timeout. It'll occur cyclically, and how often? Well, you know, doing it every day seems a little bit much. It just seems kind of wasteful. Um, I'll, how if I do it every 10 days? I'll say every 10. And what do we do? What do we have to do here? We want to display. It's going to be changing over time. Why will it be changing over time? Will their income change over time? Will people's income change over time? Now, what will be changing over time? The count of times they've been infected. And so if we see a little dot here, we kind of imagine that it, it's going to be not changing in income, but it might be moving upwards as the count of times infected grows, right? Right? Okay. So we have to flush all the data out and then populate the data set. So we're going to say, how do we flush the data out? We say income versus count times infected the data set dot reset. Do we need a semicolon? Darn right we do. Why is that, Nona? Oh, oh, why, why is that, Nona? Do it. Okay. Okay. 
Then what do we have to do? You know the shtick. What do we have to do? Each person is going to be a dot. What do we have to do? We loop over each person. There's actually more elegant ways to do this. A little bit more elegant, but I don't want to confuse you. Java streams are actually not so bad. It's actually quite nice to do it in Java. It's slick for certain needs. It's slick. It's it's really nice. Uh, and it's crisp. Um, okay. Each person in the population, what do we do? We're going to add their, their, what are we going to add to the data set for each person? We're going to add to the data set. So income, we have to tell, hey, data set. Go add this point. What point is it? Add. We're going to add a pair of values. What's the X value going to be? The first of them. What is it going to be? What's the horizontal? There, the person's what? P dot income. The person's income. Person is called P. What's the other one going to be? What's the other one going to be? How does it know the count of times infected? Who added that? Ladies and gentlemen, we did. The fate, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Um, We added that. Okay, maybe it wasn't Brutus. I, I can't remember. Dear some, somebody. Um, Do we need a semicolon, Nona? After adding this in, do we need a semicolon? Why is that, Nona? We have to we're telling you do it right as count times in fact that's right it's like nike um okay we need a semicolon i'll put it up on the big screen so you can see it okay but i think you get the shtick you get the idea so we reset it we clear all the values we go through each person in the in the population we add their income and their count of times affected that's the pair we have for them and it will put it in the plot. Are we okay with that? We'll let the plot resize so it's the number of times they're infected. It will kind of scroll upwards. Are we okay with this? Build early. And what's the other thing you do? You build early and often. And you run early and what? Often. often. Okay, so we're going to run it. Here we go. Okay, let's see if we can get up to that plot here. You can already see starting to, there's some evidence of it spreading. There's a person infected. I, I, I know it's a bit painful with the number of connections, so I apologize for that. What do we see here? Oh my gosh, went too far. I'm sorry. I may help to zoom out here. Maybe I'll, I'll seek to zoom out and Oh no, what do we forget to do? Okay, how do we do it? Where do we go to remove them? To the plot, to the plot. Yeah, and and by the way, display up to not, not 100, display up to 10,000 latest samples. We're only gonna at a time add it, you know, maybe a thousand here, but we, we don't wanna truncate it at zero. And the other thing is you have to go to appearance and you have to say, um, uh, do not draw a line. Otherwise, it's going to draw these lines for us. So we don't we don't want to connect successive points. There are times where sometimes that's useful, but I, I wish it weren't the. It's too bad it's the default. I, I think that's kind of a bit over the top. How did I do that? I went to main, went to this thing, uncheck draw a line. Okay, so let's let's go check it out. Here we go. Maybe to divide my difficulties, I'll with scrolling, I'll try it this way. I'll scroll, I'll, I'll zoom out a bit so I could just see it there. Well, okay, it's easier said than done. Okay, well, maybe it's easier to go out at that level. Okay, come on. Okay. Okay, so so what is what's going on here right now? Like like why why don't you see many dots? Where are the dots? The start of people there for us. Zero. Yeah. What's what's the 
What's the, that's right. There's almost a green, yes. a green film here, right? Um, what's the maximum number of times someone's been infected so far? Well, there's one person at three, maybe, or some, a few number at three. Okay. So, so let's, let's, let's speed this up. Let's, uh, um, okay, okay. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. What's what's going on here? Why is it just sort of ending here and then there's a sharp drop off? Anyone? Because poor people, they're crowded and then they contact. And then that's right. And these folks may not even be connected with the poor people. They're living in gated enclaves, right? And it's not even getting in there. Let's only have this plot go up, display up to maybe 2,000. Something like that, um, weekly income. So I'm going to go set the scale for this plot. I'm going to set the horizontal scale to be auto, but the, excuse me, the, the horizontal scale to be from zero to 2,000, I mean. Mm -hmm. The vertical scale be from uh, uh, auto. So what did I do? I went to this plot. I opened the scale thing up, although it was already open for me. I set the horizontal scale to be fixed from zero to 2000. Are we ready for this? Can we do it? Can we, can we display it? Are you okay? Okay, let's go run it again. Now, I do wanna say, look, I know writing code is, is hard, but one of any logic's really nice features is there is an awful lot you can do declaratively by just saying, you know, change this, change that visually. You you go and you 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 adjust it, and it's you can actually do a lot without writing a lot of code. It that's not to say you don't have to write code ever. You the the you know fact of life is you kind of do sometimes have to write code, but there is a lot you can do by saying you know don't draw lines and you know um, set the scale in this way and you know add these uh, just plot this value. Uh, Etc. So, so there's something to be said for that. It's 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 got some things thought through. Okay, so let's let's take a look at what's going on here. First of all, why are these points headed upwards? What's going on? Why are they headed upwards? What what's someone's x location value? Well, this person. What what does it mean that they're at x location about uh, seven hundred or six sixty three? What does that mean? What's the, that's determined by their what? by their income. Why are they headed upwards here? What does it mean about this person here? Like that they have a value of, of uh, 133. What does that mean? They've been what? Infected 133 times, right? Maybe this is a cold, a common cold or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, you notice the shape of this plot. It just just want to highlight this to you, right? What's going on here? So broadly, we have lower incomes compared to higher incomes. Which in which area is the burden of infection higher? Lower income. Is this a linear curve? Is it a straight line down? For higher incomes, what are these values? Why don't we see them easily? What are they? Zero. 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 They're, they're, look at that. There's a lot of zeros here, actually, quite a few. If, if, if you run this thing, you'll actually notice that while well, these, these ones on the left, um, I'm not sure why. Oh, this isn't um, going, hey, come on, come on out of this. Um, uh, Bumble, blue, mutes. Anyway, um, these were being dragged up less frequently than that. This was going up at higher velocity than this. Why is that? They're getting reinfected quicker, right? Probably, yeah, it's probably doing a garbage collection there or something. Oh, okay, fine. 
Um, this almost looks, it's not quite flat. It almost looks somewhat linear over this. There's a slight gradient, right? It's highest in the very lowest population, but these population members are high enough. It's still really high. Um, then it has this kind of drop off around, around income, weekly income around 900 or something. It starts to drop up. It has a steeper decline. And then it goes, it drops off to zero altogether. Um, anyone want to guess why is this zero? Despite this being like 900, 700 times or whatever, why is this zero? Probably a gap. Yeah, there's probably a gap in the network structure. I somewhat arbitrarily chose to 2000. Right? Um, it's, a, it's a gap in network structure. Probably they're connected components. There's a connected component that reaches out probably by the look of it to maybe, you know, about this 1200, you know, around 1300. And then, and then after that, we're not reaching. Some, some of these people here have lower incomes, but they may be in disconnected components there um, uh, down there. But here, what we see is a curve. Now, this shape, was not in any way directly was not directly programmed into the model. This shape, this shape, is dictated by a lot of different factors within the model. Right? Um, <clears throat> gave rise to the shape. This is an emergent property of the model. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have been able to if you had asked me this morning. I built a lot of these models. I wouldn't have been able to draw exactly what this is. I might have, you know, some of the details are different. I would have expected a bit more of a steeper gradient for the lower incomes and so on. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting. There's there's greater spread here than here. There's the the numbers are here, bigger here, but it's a tighter spread than than here, for example. We have some lower, some higher. Probably the network is less dense and it. Some people are have fewer infections because they're more in the periphery. Some some are more central, and then there's kind of this drop off, um, probably having to do with the uh, the network parameters, the network sort of structure parameters, and, and then it kind of drops off. Would this be different if we set the default contact rate differently? Yeah, it, it will be different, um, but it. It does raise some interesting questions. You know, for example, if we could vaccinate people, which people here might be really good candidates for being high, you know, high, um, high leverage for 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 vaccinating, protect them a lot. Well, it'll be those lower income folks, right? But if we can improve crowding conditions, um, that might make quite a big difference in this, right? Um, uh, so, so it brings up some questions, but this is an example of an emergent property from this model. Does it reflect assumptions about contact rate? Yeah. Does it reflect assumptions about the network structure? Yeah. Does it reflect assumptions about the waning of immunity? Yeah. Does it affect, uh, reflect assumptions about the latent period? Yes. It's it, but it entangles all of them in these these kind of striking patterns uh, and gradients. It is not linear. Uh, uh, a linear regression would not match this well. Um, and once we start to see interventions, it they may shape, change the shape of this curve in some notable ways. If we focused our interventions based on income, or based on number of connections that people had, or based on number of times they've been infected in the past, you know, the, some measure of need. The curve that's generated, the emergent properties, the, the, the patterns we see in the data may be quite different. So it's worth remembering in this age of data-driven science and, you know, paying attention to patterns and things. That's all worthy stuff. But patterns are often contingent on the nature of the data generating process. So when we intervene, say with an intervention campaign, with a campaign to alleviate housing, 
it can alter those patterns often in really notable ways. Yeah. Um, uh, wondering if this has a cyclical trend, a bunch of burnt out uh, population entering susceptible after a certain period. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Um, could there be this kind of pulsing through the network? Yes, I, I would. Um, that could occur. It, it's not quite synchronized so much because um, of the sort of randomness and when people recover. But there are really interesting systems where you get entrainment phenomena where you actually get emergent phenomena that like pulse it. It's not that that's built in, but it emerges from these things and it leads to kind of self-synchrony um, of the system. That's quite interesting. I wouldn't expect it here, but I, I couldn't totally rule it out. I'd have to think about it. Transmission is heavily dependent on the number of connections. Um, uh, that's right, um, as shown by the spread at the, the tail end. That's, uh, that's exactly right, yeah. Um, okay, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, um, I'd like to take whatever time people want to um, spend here, and we can do some more work towards uh, projects uh, for those in the incubator. I apologize for going a little bit late here, uh, but um, we will reconvene here as a group uh, tomorrow at 8.30, okay? Yes. Um, just hypothetical, would there be any value in seeking out and vaccinating like bottleneck people in that? Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> that's an excellent idea. Yeah, so if people have high betweenness centrality, so they're, we talk about different types of centrality in social network analysis. Um, one of them is degree centrality, where you're, for a given person, so these are measures of a person's place, the role they play in the network. They're, they place the place structurally, and, and I'll be with you just a sec. Degree centrality is, you know, how many connections they have. That's the most kind of local ones. A lot of the more interesting ones have to do with um, the role they play in the broader network. Between the centralities on how many paths, if you, if you were to look at all pairs of people, how many of those paths go through that person? If there's a lot of paths going through them, they're like at a crossroads, right? They're like at a particularly strategic position. Maybe, or a lot of the shortest paths between people. Maybe there's not many ways you can get from one area of the network to another except through them. And they could, that person could be a bridge, you know, a, a key waypoint um, in the spread of infection. If you could block that spread, Yes, yeah, so I think it's a brilliant idea. You might be able to really reduce that propagation. And that person may may not be the poorest person here, right? The lowest income, but they they they're more likely to be lower income in some cases. But the interesting thing is that like if they're in a very, very dense area of the network, so they're individually at risk and at risk of if they get infected, spreading it to lots of people they're less likely to be quite on a bottleneck because there's lots of others around them that are also, that are, that are tightly connected. It's, it's really probably in the kind of meso space, not micro, not macro, but, but sort of uh, levels of income, but somewhere in between where you're starting to see the, the paths thin out, but they're still reasonably well connected that you might think about that. And the interesting thing is you could make an argument for vaccinating someone by the number of connections they have. After all, if they have lots of connections, they could be like a magnet for infection because lots of, you know, they're connected with lots of people. If any of them get infected, they, of those people to whom they're connected, they get infected. They can also disseminate infection very broadly because they can spread it to a large number of people. But Someone with high betweenness centrality may be strategic from a bigger network perspective. And you absolutely get virtues of that, of, of, of focusing on those people. And there are public health case studies, which have looked at, you know, people carrying TB from, there are traveling salesmen, they go from one community to the other, bringing TB, tuberculosis, in a way that is disastrous for the, for the communities. And if you could make sure that person doesn't get TB or is diagnosed, you know, is, is given a 
prophylactic against it or, or if exposed to, uh, or, or given a you know, BCG vaccination or what have you, or some more effective, more modern type, um, or if you were to make sure they get regularly tested, what have you, you, you could, um, you could potentially really lower that spread, even if they themselves are not necessarily having tons of connections that they can bring it to a new area of the network. So that's, that's a really interesting uh, topic, but yes, Jared. So in the United States, there is a little bit of a border wall that happens economically already because of the people who have insurance mm. versus those who don't have insurance who are and those who are underinsured. Mm. Um, so think about what it takes to get a vaccine, mm. right? You've got to have insurance is probably going to pay for it unless we have a phenomenon like uh, the federal government paying for all the COVID vaccines, which was amazing, except they aren't doing that now. So you're only getting right. boosters if your private insurance is covering your COVID boosters. It's not. But you've got to have a certain type of person that's got some flexibility in their work schedule who can make it to a doctor office, who, mm. can, who has a primary care physician, most likely. Uh, mm. A lot of poor people are using urgent care facilities and only go when it's a crisis. They're not going to go just because they need to go get a vaccine. Mm. So what you would see in this model, if we could scroll down, we would probably see a wall where above mm. a certain income, people have access to vaccines. Oh, wow. right. Wow. And at, at that lower income, because there's so much health disparity in the wow. United States. Wow. Wow. Right. So there would be a wall effect. Oh, God. basically. Yeah. Where having having good employment that has insurance. Right. And having just a little so, flexibility in your daily schedule that I can make it to a doctor's office. Yeah. Right. It, it doesn't take much. In right? access to transport. To, yeah. To oh, yeah. Having access or, to transportation. Or, or having a local provider. We have no public yeah. transportation yeah. in yeah. our country. Yeah. So. It, yeah, there That's, was. You would effectively have a wall. So where wow. you know, we have a totally lit up yeah. network, we would see a, a wall around a certain income wow. in the United States. Wow, where the poor would just constantly reinfect each other over and over and over again. Wow, with the burden of long COVID or whatever. That, right. We yeah. Gotta add whatever yeah. goes with it. Wow, that's really sobering, and it would. It would manifest in in terms of those emergent gradients that we see by income, right. potentially so even more. Um, whoa, sorry. Um, so what I would do is yeah. I would go to that reinfection. Yeah. Uh, or no, we didn't call it reinfection. What did we call it? Uh, waning immunity. Right. And if you got a vaccine, instead of 45 days of immunity, you get 365 days of immunity wow. or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Like a flu vaccine, right? You mm -hmm. get a vaccine once a year, you're good for that year's right. variance of flus, right? Right. So, wow. right, so you got that flu vaccine all of a sudden, that's going to change. So yeah. that'd be an interesting thing to add. What happens if people above a certain income get a vaccine? Right, it changes waning their waning immunity number. Get vaccinated, well, um, and and very 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 doable. That yeah. would take about <laughs> about yeah half an hour to an hour up to do, and including sort of administration of the vaccine yeah. based on on someone's uh, someone's income and so on. And yeah, it would probably change this emergent graph. Right. Yeah. The interesting thing is this, like. This graph, it has characteristics that recur. I just ran this again, and you see a similar structure, right? This, this structure is conserved across runs of the model. It's not just total happenstance. It has these shared characteristics tighter up here, more diffuse here, zero down there. In broad terms, you know, these things recur and recur, and it's an emergent property that reflects the characteristics, but it would change if you initiate a vaccination campaign, you know, or you were to um, uh, to have free reimbursement for all vaccines for everyone or what have you. So yeah, really, really uh, very, very interesting observations. So I'm gonna save this um, 
and uh, I will post it here as version six for anyone who would like to uh, would like to obtain this. Okay, um, and uh, I do want to emphasize what we've done. Um, it's not only lots of specific details about it that are new to us, you know, um, putting in place uh, a, uh, a scatter plot involving income or, or having disparities in income. But important as those, th th those things are, what we have here is a model with people interacting in, in, in a nonlinear way. Um, this model will give very different results. On the one hand, if you were to simulate it with only people who start infectious, <laughs> no, no one starting susceptible, only you, you focus only on those starting infectious, just that one person, and you were to simulate it, you get one set of results, right? I'm very interesting. Simulate it separately with just those starting susceptible with no infected, get a set of results. If you add those together, it's very different dynamics than if you simulate it with both together. It's not a linear thing. F of A plus B is not equal to F of A plus F of B. No, 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 no. It's very different. You need two to tangle. You need both. And the two, the entanglement of both, the, the, the susceptibles and the effectives give totally different. So, and that's what we see written on. Okay. Okay. I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you, everyone. We'll reconvene at, at 4.30. But I would encourage further discussion right now about the projects and apologies for going the later cycle. Thank you. Great. Thank you.